Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. I want to thank you for tuning in to Texas Today. This episode is being released at the end of January 2021, so I hope everybody is off to a good start for the new year. We're in a legislative session year here in Texas, which is always active and exciting. A little bit different during uh, lockdown situations that are still occurring, but the Capitol is open, so... Uh, They'll give you a COVID test, and you can go in there and see your legislature in action. Although, check before you go to make sure that uh, there's limited space in the gallery, so make sure. But I always encourage you during a legislative session to spend some time in the Capitol if you can. It is uh, the people's Capitol, and you should go down there and check it out, especially if you love Texas history. Of course, there's a lot of history in that Capitol, and it's really a good time to spend a day just walking the halls. Today we're going to talk about something that occurred in that Capitol building back in 1925. You know, it's inevitable with Texas's growth that the government buildings are often repurposed. So if you go into historic courthouses or other historic buildings, including the Capitol, a lot more used to occur in that building than occurs now because the government grows and you need additional space and additional buildings. Well, in 1925, the Texas Supreme Court sat in the Capitol building. So we're going to talk a little bit about something uh, that radically changed the Texas Supreme Court in 1925. In fact, if you had watched this particular case, you wouldn't even recognize the court. Today, we're going to talk about the day that the entire makeup of the Texas Supreme Court totally changed. So let's go back to 1925 and get wise about Texas. The Texas Supreme Court today consists of nine justices and has for a while, but back in the early 20th century, for a long time, the Texas Supreme Court only consisted of three justices. So in 1925, uh, there were three justices on the Supreme Court. And a case came out of El Paso. The case involved some real estate in El Paso, and I'm not going to give you too many details about it because the a sure way for me to lose subscribers to this podcast would be, be to go into detail about uh, real estate litigation. But suffice to say, it involved real estate, involved some insurance, and involved uh, someone trying to collect a judgment against that real estate, uh, a foreclosure, on that real estate and some insurance provided by an organization called Woodman of the World. Woodman of the World started as an insurance association in 1890 in Omaha, Nebraska, and it's since grown. The modern, uh, they've changed their name. It's now called Woodman Life, Uh, but it was a very prominent organization. By 1915, there were over 750,000 members of Woodman of the World. So Woodman of the World insurance had factored into this El Paso lawsuit. The essence of the lawsuit was whether an unrecorded trust agreement, in other words, a trust agreement that was not filed in the deed records of the county, was going to be enforced. So the case came from the trial court to the appeals court in El Paso. The appellate opinion in El Paso was issued, and the uh, losing party sought review in the Texas Supreme Court. So the Texas Supreme Court has the discretion whether to take cases uh, that are appealed to it or not. Uh, It's called a discretionary review court. And so uh, the case comes to the Supreme Court first for a decision on whether the Supreme Court is going to hear the case. Well, it turns out that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, now this is 1924, Um, I've said 1925, that's when the case was heard. 1924, this this part of the procedure was was going on. The Chief Justice was C.M. Curitan, and the Associate Justices were Thomas B. Greenwood and William Pearson. Well, there was a problem. All three of them, Curitan, Greenwood, and Pearson, were affiliated in some fashion with Woodman of the World. So they were disqualified from hearing this appeal. When that happens, Governor Neff, Pat Neff, who was governor at the time, had to appoint 
special justices to the Texas Supreme Court. And that's a that's a uh, procedure that still occurs from time to time today. If there's an 8-8 split and there's not a ninth justice on the court, uh, the chief justice can bring someone to sit for a particular case. Um, if there's a vacancy for whatever reason on the court, you can appoint what would be called a special justice, or if it were to replace the chief, it would be the special chief justice. So Neff needed to find other judges to sit for this case involving Woodman of the World. Well, I mentioned earlier there were over 750,000 members of Woodman of the World in the early 20s, probably more by then. That 750,000 number was surpassed in 1915. So here in 1924, he was looking for judges to sit on the Supreme Court. Well, he couldn't find anybody that wasn't a member of Woodman of the World. So this goes on throughout 1924. The case is scheduled to come before the court on the decision of whether to take it or not. In early January 1925, the other thing that was going on was Ma Ferguson, Governor Miriam Ferguson, was elected in 1924, so she was going to take office in 1925. So Neff needed to resolve this. And so on January 1st, 1925, Neff came up with a solution. Woodman of the World did not accept female members. So Neff decided he would appoint three women to the Texas Supreme Court. Now let's put this in context of the time. It was only seven years before that Texas women were even allowed to vote. Now Texas was about to inaugurate its first female governor. Pat Neff had traditionally appointed uh, women to state boards and commissions, which was a fairly new phenomenon in Texas. So Governor Neff appointed the country's first all-women Supreme Court. And here's who he appointed. First, he appointed Nellie Robertson of Granbury, Texas. Uh, she was the county attorney of Hood County. He also appointed Edith Wilmans from Dallas. Now, she had served as a member of the 38th legislature, and I believe was the first woman elected to the Texas legislature. He also appointed Hortense Sparks Ward from Houston, who was practicing law with her husband. Miss um, Robertson, uh, the county attorney, was designated chief justice, and Miss Ward and Miss Wilmans were the associate justices. Well, right after the appointment, we ran into some problems. Uh, Miss Wilmans announced uh, that she could not serve on the Texas Supreme Court because to serve on the Texas Supreme Court at that time, you had to have been in practice for seven years, and she was two months short of that. So she resigned. Then uh, Miss Robertson, the special chief justice, announced that she had only practiced law for six years and nine months and also resigned her appointment. So Neff's great idea immediately went sideways, but not to fear. Uh, he managed to salvage the Supreme Court by replacing Miss um, Wilmans with Hattie Lee Hennenberg, also of Dallas. So I'll tell you a little bit about Miss Hennenberg. Hattie Hennenberg was born in Ennis in 1893. Uh, she moved to Dallas uh, to go to school. She studied at what was then called the Dallas Law School, which was part of uh, SMU, and was admitted to the state bar in 1916. She was supervising the what was called the Free Legal Aid Bureau in Dallas. Now, this is near and dear to my heart. I'm a commissioner on the Texas Access to Justice Commission, which tries to ensure that all Texans have access to the justice system. And so Miss Hennenberg was one of the early access to justice attorneys. Later in her, her career, she was an assistant attorney general for the state, uh, practice law in Dallas. She was very involved in the election campaigns of Franklin Roosevelt and John Nance Garner and was also an assistant county attorney in Dallas. To replace Robertson, Neff chose Ruth Virginia Brazel, who was from Galveston. Now, Miss Brazel had a little bit different legal career. She passed the bar in 1912, and she worked her way through the University of Texas as a special student in law. 
but she didn't just practice law. She was a realtor. She managed an abstract company, and she was also affiliated with the American National Life Insurance Company, a very well-known company in Galveston. She later moved to Bandera, where she was the postmistress. She sold real estate in the Centerpoint and Kerrville areas, and interestingly, uh, which you'll find out why this is interesting in a minute, she was said to be uh, opposed to women's suffrage, which is going to play a big role in the life of the third justice on this court, Hortense Sparks Ward. Now, she was elevated to special chief justice when Robertson had to resign. Hortense Sparks Ward was the first woman in Texas to pass the state bar exam. She did so in 1910. She was also the first woman from Texas to be admitted to practice before the United States Supreme Court, which she was in 1915. She was born in Matagorda County in 1875. She was married to a man named Malsh, in, or Malsh. She had uh, three daughters with Mr. Malsh, um, but then divorced him in 1906. And, and her divorce papers say that, um, alleged that Malsh was a quote unquote no account and only worked about half the time. So that sounds like grounds to me. Uh, she later married an attorney in Houston named William Henry Ward. Ward would go on to be county judge of Harris County a couple of different times. Uh, but when she married him, they practiced law together in the firm of Ward and Ward. And Miss Ward wasted no time in making an impact in Texas. She lobbied the legislature to pass the Married Women's Property Law of 1913. And I won't go into too much detail of that, but it was significant because even though Texas had community property, which goes back to the goes back to Queen Isabella in Spain, the husband nevertheless had sole management authority. So even though you might own half of the community property, the man could just up and sell it uh, out from under you. So Ward thought that was unfair, so she got that law passed. She was an ardent prohibitionist, it is said, and uh, she co-authored the Constitutional Amendment in 1919 to bring prohibition to the Texas State Constitution, and she was president of the Houston Equal Suffrage Association in 1918. So she was big into the women's suffrage movement. She wrote and published pamphlets uh, for women on how to advocate for suffrage and later how to vote, and her pamphlets were used in a statewide campaign to persuade women to register to vote when they were going to uh, be able to. And in in uh, 17 days in 1918, the summer of 1918, nearly 386,000 women registered to vote. And Hortense Sparks Ward, this was June 27th, 1918, Hortense Sparks Ward was the first woman in Harris County, Texas history to register to vote. So she really was a force of nature. And now she was the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court, if only for this one case. So now that they were appointed, they had to meet and decide whether they were going to actually take that El Paso appeal. So that meeting occurred on January 8, 1925. Now it was recognized at the time how important this was. In fact, the New York Times on January 8th had a headline that read, quote, Supreme Court of Women, first such body in the country, meets in Texas today. The Jacksboro Gazette uh, wrote of that meeting, it was the first, quote, it was the first time in the history of Texas and probably in the history of any other state of the United States that a woman ever made an announcement from the bench of a Supreme Court. That same Jacksboro Gazette article quoted uh, Chief Justice Hortense Ward from the bench as follows, quote, application number 13371 W.T. Johnson et al. versus J.N. Dar et al. from El Paso County for writ of error is granted. And the cause set for argument January 30, 1925. And her next sentence was this, quote, I think that is all except to have our pictures taken, close quote. Everybody knew how important this was. By the way, before they took the bench that day, they had to be sworn in, uh, which they were by Chief Justice C.M. Curitan. And when you take your oath of office, you, you have to sign an actual paper 
form with the oath on it. And uh, the, the Jacksboro Gazette article, the reason I'm using it is it closes with this observation. This is the um, last two sentences of this article. Quote, it was noticed that Miss Brazel, in signing the oath, used her left hand. The other members of the special signed with their right hand. Close quote. So not sure why the author decided to put that in there, but there you have it. Well, the court heard argument on January 30th, and the Hallettsville Herald on February 3rd, 1925, reported on the event. And here is the uh, first sentence of that article, quote, Woman in Texas reached the zenith of her power here today in state affairs. While one was in the governor's chair, three others gravely sat as the first feminine Supreme Court in the country, close quote. Well, they made their decision, and they decided that the trust that wasn't recorded was, in fact, valid. Chief Justice Ward wrote the opinion, uh, but interestingly, each of the two associate justices, Justice Hennenberg and Justice Brazel, each wrote separately. They wrote what's called a concurrence, which means you agree with the result, but you're going to explain why you agree with the result. So each member of the first all-woman Supreme Court in the country got to write an opinion in this case, and that concluded the service of the first all-woman Supreme Court in the country. Another little interesting tidbit is uh, women at that time in 1925 were not even allowed to serve on juries, but they could sit on the Texas Supreme Court. In fact, they wouldn't serve on juries until almost 30 years afterwards. And it wasn't until 1982 when a woman was appointed for the first time to be a full-time justice on the Texas Supreme Court. That was Justice Ruby Sondock who is an attorney in Houston and a world-renowned mediator, and all the lawyers listening to this are chuckling, because Justice Sondock will get your case settled. And as I record this in 2021 now, four of the nine justices on the Texas Supreme Court are women, all colleagues and friends of mine, and rightful heirs to the legacy of Hortense Sparks Ward as strong Texas women. In fact, that's really what this episode is about, isn't it? Even in 1925, when there were barely any women lawyers and women were forbidden from deciding cases in the trial court, leave it to Texas women to serve with distinction on the highest court of the state of Texas and blaze yet another trail for the rest of the nation. Well, now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you how to see uh, locations mentioned in the episode. Well, this is a tough one. Uh, what locations could I have mentioned? Well, there is one place that you should go. When you go to the Capitol, as I encouraged you to do in the introduction, the old Supreme Court chamber is still there and it is preserved. It's on the third floor of the Capitol building. Uh, you, you can go into the doorway and see the very room where Chief Justice Ward and Associate Justices Hennenberg and Brazel presided over the Johnson v. Dar case. The portraits hanging over the bench are the same portraits that hung over uh, Justice Ward's court, as you will see on the social media post when I post that picture. So you are looking at the very room where it happened. Special Chief Justice Ward is buried in Hollywood Cemetery in Houston at North Main in I-45 if you want to visit and pay your respects. Uh, Ruth Brazel, died in Kerrville, Texas. Uh, she's buried in Kerrville at the Garden of Memory Cemetery on Fredericksburg Road. And Justice Hennenberg is buried in Restland Cemetery on Restland Road in Dallas, Texas. Uh, interestingly, another little tidbit for you, the Johnson v. Dar case, the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society reenacted the argument uh, of Johnson v. Dar in 2016 and for that reenactment, a descendant of Justice Ward, uh, a very nice lady named Linda Hunsecker, lent the uh, proceedings the original wooden gavel that Hortense Sparks Ward used to call the all-woman Supreme Court to order. And that was a great event. And you can go to the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society website, which is um, texascourthistory.org. You can find an article on that reenactment. And I want to close today with a little tribute and a dedication to a 
great Texas history figure that we lost late last year, Larry Spasick. Larry was uh, the director of the San Jacinto Museum of History at the San Jacinto Monument. That's the museum at the base of the monument. He joined that museum in 1989, and he really loved Texas history. He loved the San Jacinto Monument, and he loved educating and hosting people at that museum. Larry was one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, and uh, it was always a pleasure to see him, and we're going to miss him very much. So I'll dedicate this episode of Wise About Texas to Larry Spasick. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Thanks for tuning in for a little bit of Texas history. You can find the show on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. Like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. And if you get a minute, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That helps other people find the show. If you want to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Wise About Texas and you can support the show there. Thanks again for tuning in. Go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.